Hi, everybody. Welcome to Poetry of Place. I'm Kathy Haley, Vice President of the Northern Region of PSV, Poetry Society of Virginia. And I'm excited to be featuring today Rich Holette and Catherine M. Gotthart. And Catherine, would you actually say your last name the way Brian James said it once that I can't replicate? <laughs> you actually said it correctly. It's Gotthart, like got, got a heart. Okay, but he said it the German way, I think. Oh, 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 I cannot say that. So, Brian, why don't you say it? <laughs> <laughs> Brian, can you? I believe it was Gahart, but I, I was that wrong? That okay. might have been incorrect. <laughs> I, I thought maybe I was saying it wrong all these years. <laughs> anyway, it's really nice to have you both, both wonderful poets. And um, I'm going to just do a quick opening that I used when I did the first episode of Poetry of Place, um, because that day I had coincidentally um, received in my email um, this particular um, quote from Courtney Faye Taylor, a Cave Canem fellow and author of Concentrate. Um, she was in a Poets and Writers um, email and said about travel and poetry of place. I visit Detroit to see my line sisters, Charlotte to see my mother, Brooklyn to see my love. I'm appreciative of what travel offers me artistically, a chance to experience something new and in turn, say something new. There's the poet I am in Michigan, the poet I am in North Carolina, and the one I am in New York. Each poet is distinct, each should speak. I thought that was interesting. Um, and maybe you look at poetry of place that way, the way that you take on a different voice as you travel from place to place. Or maybe you look at poetry of place in a more focused way, considering places like your backyard, the mountains, the beach, um, you know, particular um, spots within a city rather than you know, the whole of a city. Um, so I'm curious to see how you have selected your poems and how they reflect place in some way. Um, and we'll start with Rich Follett. Happy anniversary, Rich. And thank you. Wife. <laughs> I'm so delighted to be with you. And thank you all for being here to share this time. Thank you, Kathy, for asking me to come. Absolutely. And let me just say a few things about you, but you can add what you want. <laughs> I'm just going to say that, that Rich is Poet Laureate of Strasburg, Virginia. He has many published books and um, journal publications. He's featured in the ODU Virginia Poets Database. And um, he is a musician. And I don't know how he follows the schedule he does as a teacher, a musician, and a poet who's constantly traveling, even if it's short distances. Just last week, I did a Zoom meeting on the side of the highway as I was traveling from one gig to another. People had to see my car behind me, but we do what I we do. I was at that meeting, Rich, so that, that's- There you go. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tend to interpret things fairly literally. So I took poetry of place to mean poetry that that featured a particular geographical place. And as the poet laureate from my small town, I have a, a rich knapsack of poems that have to do with place. Um, I enjoy writing about my town and the surrounds and the valley. And I also enjoy writing about historical events and things that really happened. Um, this first poem that I've chosen is called Shenando 1870. And Shenando is how Shenandoah was pronounced back at that time, just after the Civil War. And uh, it concerns a time when the weather was particularly disastrous for the agriculture in the valley. Shenando, 1870. That one autumn, that cruel come early autumn, when the river became our enemy and the leaves went straight to brown, the valley itself was in mourning weeping for promises broken. Stillborn crop bargello, sinister as snake skin, coarse as corn mash, sloughing off windswept hills, submerging vain hope, choking even pestilent vetch into whimpers. That one autumn eviscerated spirits, 
nascent folials fell too soon, returning to the vacuum of sodden earth in slime-laden dun cadenzas. It was said that an acre died for every fruitless tear consumed by the merciless torrent. That one autumn, a deluge deaf to prayers, when the rain and the rage subsided, we harvested stone. Mm. Wow. Beautiful. Thank you. I did, never knew that that pronunciation had existed. It's actually on the floor of the courthouse, inlaid into the marble floors of the courthouse. There's this, the county seal from when the courthouse was built, and it says Shenanda. Really cool. Wow. Um, this is one of my poet laureate poems, as, as was the last one. It's, it's called To Make a Town. It takes several lifetimes to make a town, many hands, earnest sweat, and unflinching cycles of flood, fire, and famine through measured seasons of hope and despair in cruel and benevolent equipoise. It takes pioneers to inhabit a town, pragmatic, tireless adamants repelled by luxury, sweeping grit out of rough-hewn corners to coax a feeling of home from never-wasted smidgens and bits sewn into a rustic patchwork of faith. It takes knowing seers to shape a town, to temper prosperity with restraint, to build what is needed instead of what boasts. It takes careful stewards to keep a town, preserving rituals, upholding traditions, passing down memories, and most of all, most of all, holding on. Very nice. Thank you. Curious, um, especially after hearing Ada Lamone say how difficult it was for her to write the poem that she had to write for the um, liftoff of the spaceship, um, how how challenging it is when they ask you to write a specific type of poem. It can be very challenging. Um, I, obviously, being a, an agrarian community in the Shenandoah Valley, values are conservative. Traditions are time-honored. Change does not come easily. And I have to straddle a pretty big fence sometimes to, to get my job done. Uh, but I don't approach that with dread. I, I really welcome the challenge, and I try to rise to it. And so far, I, I can boast really good success. People really look forward to the poems that I write. And, and when they come out, um, they're always supportive and... It's nice. It's just nice. I, I take a lot of joy in my little position of poet laureate. And I've learned a great deal, too. Mm -hmm. I've learned that writing for a community audience means I sometimes don't get to write what I might like to write. I have to. You were talking about maybe assuming a different voice as a way to express place. I have to imagine myself as an amalgam of my community mm -hmm. and say what I either what I think they would say or what it is that I think they might need to hear. Mm -hmm. And I do both of those things. And I'm also a very opinion, I'm a, not opinionated, I'm a very, I'm a very passionate person. And it's, it's hard sometimes to stay out of personal goings on in the town. Mm -hmm. I really have to remind myself to be Switzerland. Yes. And that's, that's a challenge. But this is a perfect example. This is Pride Day. The mayor asked me to write a poem for Pride Day in Strasbourg. Good God. You know, talk about a fool's errand, but this is called Pride Day. If the house is on fire, any hand can carry a bucket. When the creek is rising, it does not matter whose shoulder a sandbag rests on. To break a fever, any stream can dampen a cool cloth. In times of trial, prayers of any faith will reach God's ear. In desperate hours, we come together. We do what we must to survive. Why, then, do we question whose arms hold whom, where love is involved? This town exists because many hands and many hearts came together, wherever the need arose for many generations, to hold out and hold on whenever lives and livelihoods were in peril. Turn to your neighbor. Imagine his house her house, their house, your house on fire. 
Does the color, size, or shape of the bucket we bring to the brigade really matter? There may not be flames today, neighbors, but doesn't it make good sense for all of us to keep our buckets full and ready? I love that approach. I, I did get to hear that at the recent Zoom meeting. When yes, you were in the yes, I know that's a repeat. Um, but. I, but I like it very much, and I think it's a really good il illustration of what you were just talking about. Okay, I don't want to overstay my welcome here, so keep me honest, people. You're um, good. You, you, um, have, you know, up to 20 minutes. You don't have to okay. fill up the minutes. All right, but... well, this, I wanted to read this one because it's a little on the longish side, but if you stick with me, it has a little bit of a payoff at the end. Um, I I write a lot from personal experience. I'm, I'm not actually a terribly imaginative poet. I don't make up much. I just sort of function as a camera. And this is from a true episode in my life. It's called Kentucky, 1969. My father, much given to wanderlust, woke us at three one summer morning, whistling a strain of hard times come again no more, and announcing matter-of-factly that we would drive straight from Long Island through New York City before rush hour to Bardstown, Kentucky, Stephen Foster's birthplace. We might have known, really, the Stephen Foster songbook had occupied a place of honor on our gnarled brown upright piano for weeks prior to the excursion. Nevertheless, we were groggy and in a state of docile indifference when he ushered us, mother, brother, sister, and me, into the car in our pajamas, clutching blankets, stuffed animals, and in my mother's case, curlers and a scarf. Sixteen dust-covered, bleary-eyed hours later, on a scenic two-lane road in rural Kentucky, some three hours off course for our destination, Father did not believe in maps, choosing instead to serendipitize. We pulled into a general store and eatery, the sole watering hole in a desert of bluegrass, which had rolled by our heat-rippled half-open windows since noon. We were giddy at the prospect of a bathroom, a chance to stretch our legs, and a plate of hot home cooking, Roadside paradise. Heavenly smells within. To the right, the crowded tables and booths. To the left, a dilapidated and empty mirror image. Fearing road spawned fretfulness from children and spouse, father directed us to a booth on the quieter side. We had waited patiently for the waitress for half an hour when father approached the counter and asked for someone to please come and take our order. When another half hour brought no result, father, never a paragon of patience, surprised us with his calm demeanor in asking at the counter a second time. Only when our wait was approaching absurdity did the shy, honey-voiced waitress finally come to our table. After father inquired as to why she had not brought menus, the starched, bleached girl replied in hushed tones, I'm sorry, sir, but I can't serve you here. Oh, is this section closed? He asked. The waitress's answer was as deafening as it was quiet. She merely repeated in a lower tone, I'm sorry, but I can't serve you here. No sign or posted policy matched her inflection, only a tacit understanding to which Northerners were not privy. An interminable second later, Father's face became an inferno. He did not or could not speak. Rather, he scooped us up as if we were rag dolls, barked, we're leaving, to my aggrieved mother, and carried us, muling and unfed, out of the restaurant into our faithful station wagon, which had never felt more like home. Father was silent for many miles thereafter. My nine-year-old mind could not comprehend the unwritten rules of a 1960s eatery in the South, that it was not the section, but the people, us, violating the status quo. Eight years later, in a high school civics class, I learned that there were tables in Kentucky in 1969 at which respectable white people would never sit, where no decent white person would dream of offering or asking for service, and my childhood mise on the scene came into belated hyperfocus. In a single moment, I became a clenched fist of puffed principle and bluster, overarching time and place. 
Fifty plus years later, I can still reanimate the hot flush of anger as it rose in my callow white boy face, forever branding me as my father's son, echoing his apoplexy in the face of overweening bigotry. A wayside diner in Kentucky delivered the first sting of segregation my young life had known. Signifying death to innocence, blamelessness offered no antidote. The venom took its time, but that one excruciating glimpse poisoned me with an indelible cellular shame. Four decades later, I was filling out paperwork for an adult education course when, under race, I discovered that the only choice afforded a person of my complexion was white. I called the university business office to ask why there was no bubble for Caucasian, and I was told that government standardization had eliminated that option. Remembering a divided roadside diner and its menu of thinly veiled hatred, I crumbled the form and fed my brain elsewhere. Wow. Powerful. Thank you. A little bit long, I'm sorry, but... Just a fun one. And I'm going to share one more really quick one with you. Um, just because it's it's a nice note to end on. This is the poem that I wrote as the Strasbourg Poet Laureate for our annual Christmas tree illumination. And it's it's become something of a local classic. It gets read every year. Even when I can't attend, they get someone else to read it. Um, it's called Illumination. The scene is repeated each year up and down the valley, a town, a tannenbaum, lights and carols, while an unseeing host of others streams by on the interstate, truck tires on pavement, echoing through winter crisp ridges. This town, though, is our town, our tree, our lights, our carols, and so we love this night as we love this town like no other. A welcome is extended, a speech is made, a switch is flicked, and the tree comes to life as only a Christmas tree can. When I look at the shining faces of those who can do, who will do, of those who join hands whenever the community is in need to build, rebuild, or just to bear witness, when I look at these starlit faces, hands joined together, voices raised as one, I realize it is the tree that stands in wonder. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you all very much. And now we're going to switch over to our poet, Catherine M. Godhart. And um, Catherine is from Manassas, Virginia. Um, by way of many other places in her earlier career. And she's published many books, um, the most recently, 30 Years of Cardinal's Calling. Unless, Catherine, I've missed something after that, but it's a wonderful collection that I was lucky enough to write a blurb for. 11 books as of 2023. She's been the um, winner of... of quite a few awards and she's done a lot of work in the community um, giving back by giving her books away and giving uh, workshops in the schools and for um, other events like um, Poetcom or Scribblecom is the one that I'm thinking of, Scribblecom. So Catherine, um, I'm not seeing you right now, so let me pin you here so yeah. I, okay there you are all right you're good it's, the speaker is working so okay great and rich thank you for sharing your work that was beautiful very inspiring and i love strasburg so it's beautiful um so uh, my definition of place is a little less literal um so some of these poems actually refer to geographical places, but some of them are backyards and some of them are just kind of head spaces uh, with just sort of references to where the poems were written. So um, I'm gonna start with this one. This one is kind of a new poem. 
um, and it is called Second Language, Boston circa 1975. Dankness of the parking garage. First level always because my father liked to be early. Gasoline, oil stains, July heat, foreshadowing of mussels and beheaded fish coming in quickly through concrete columns. Excitement welling like tears. I am eager for fruit bins and pinwheels. Statues of saints, umber cakes and biscotti. Old women calling from open windows and men with slick back hair singing in the streets. I don't know what they are saying or why some of them wear chains, their chests and belt loops heavy with them. I just know it is my heritage. Va bene, cose è la vita. All right, that's life. Acceptance is a choice. Beautiful. Thank you. The addition of a second language and the, and the imagery. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, so my maiden name is Mercurio, which I took as my middle name. Um, and uh, so that uh, harkens back to my Sicilian heritage um, and my grandparents who actually did speak uh, Italian and I don't. So hopefully I didn't butcher that. <laughs> Sounded good to me. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, this is, uh, let's see, another uh, new one. I just wrote the other day, actually, it might not even be finished. Um, we took a little trip to Pennsylvania. We saw falling water. Uh, we stayed in a little town called Confluence and it was absolutely lovely. Um, when I was writing this, I was sort of putting myself back in uh, a kitchen. So that's kind of the place here. And it's called Morning Song. I notice now as I enter the older years, how words become less visible, dissolving, evaporating somewhere between the kitchen sounds of a dripping coffee pot, background music, and the dissipating feeling in my fingertips. Somewhere I read that is normal, that as we age, we turn inward, speak less, feel less, letting our children articulate for us, the morning dove hum our quiet breakfast song. Have you ever had that song in the nook of your head playing day after day? Someone said it's a theme song, something that speaks for us, speaks of us, so we no longer need the words. When I am 90, still sitting here among the trill, I think I will totally turn inside out, everyone else's thoughts infused, diffused with mine. And me and my once caffeinated tongue, fingers that felt every keystroke, you will hear my wordlessness, my quiet eyed calm, the homespun song we begged for when we were young and loquacious, convincing in our words, convinced of immortality. Wonderful. I, I've never really thought of that concept of being turned inside out. That's mm -hmm. going to stick with me for a while. Thank you. Um, this one you've heard before, Kathy, uh, this one uh, is from, and you've read it, of course, because it's in 30 Years of Cardinals Calling, um, and it was the winner of the Golden Nib Contest from Virginia Writers Club um, a couple of years back. Congratulations. Um, and it harkens back to my in-law's place uh, on Colonial Beach at, in Placid Bay. And it's called Kayak. Something about water brings me back. Back to the beach home, the way we'd gather before clouds could, fish hooks and minnows at hand, those little sacrifices nature makes for us so we might understand life's circle. And yes, early blackness, August air wrapped around our bare shoulders like a damp comforter, warming but warning us all at once that deep encouragement to get moving before extreme weather took the day. And yes, the fish we caught, we ate. Dad first, peeling off years measured in gills and scales. Mom frying fillets in the same stainless pan she'd used since we were children. And then sometimes the ocean had a voice. Waterfront, a silk sheet. Yellow kayak by the dock. Sky hinting at orange, paddles already in the boat. 
How could we not venture into its insistence, explore the hush of days gone by too fast, remembrance of last night's laughter, children making a mess of the den. And somehow in the morning, the call of carp plopping in and out of ripples they themselves created, the first croak of blue heron celebrating itself like the final surviving dinosaur. We pull the kayak into shallow water, step in, find our balance like a miracle, push off. It is the moistness that seems to do it, bring tears as we navigate low tide, salt pouring into our pores, the sweat of the nudging wind. It brings the barriers between earth and skin while everything, yes, everything whispers, this is what you were made for. Slowly we dip our oars into the world, remembering to favor neither right nor left, part the bay's water in the center. We move away from enduring sure, reminding ourselves it will always be there. We launch again into introspective dawn, paddling towards sunrise. I'm very happy to hear that poem again. It's just beautiful. And I think that Brian did a wonderful job selecting it for first place. Oh, Brian, <laughs> thank you for you to think for that. He put it in the chat. I didn't know that until I read it in the chat. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, how are we on time? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, my poems don't tend to be too long. Um, ADHD, I don't know. I could never write um, like a full-blown novel. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, hats off to the fiction writers. Um, this one is a, a draft of a new one, um, and it's called Letter Home. I do not wish to hear again about that time you got tied up in something worse than you deserved. How you wear the marks on your wrists, your eyes, how they condense whenever you see anyone that looks like him. Tell me instead how you feel when it rains, when you're wearing a tank top and each warm drop magnifies your skin. The freckle on your left shoulder, your mother called a beauty mark. The biceps you built carrying your own wood and mulch, building a home for yourself. Tell me about that time you woke early for summer gardening and in your backyard stumbled upon a doe feeding dew to her babies. How you felt like both mother and fawn, grass and morning, son and daughter, clouds opening to you like someone's true heart. How you dropped your supplies in surprise and they, still as morning, did not need to leave. Neither did you. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, we have a couple time for... Yeah, you have time. We have time? Okay. I'm so bad at this time thing. And uh, my next chat book is coming out actually, and it's all micro poetry. Um, so, you know, bit size. Mm -hmm. um, this one is from DC Acrostic, and um, Kathy, I have uh, you and uh, your daughter to thank for being introduced to uh, Acrostic Poetry. Oh, that's um, wonderful. So these poems are based on uh, photos by uh, a former boss of mine, actually, Ethan Merlin from uh, Ruston, Virginia. Um, and this one is called Fire Drill. Remember when we were in Catholic school and suddenly a winter fire drill? Those were some days, no? We line up, fight the primitive urge to run, trip walk single file through sullen double doors, gather out front in awe of the cold and this unexpected break, elbow our friend and wait. We worried about what we left inside, puffy coats, our favorite pencils and backpacks, Soggy breaded bologna and cheese, brown bagged. We dared not bring our belongings. Teacher would have yelled at us. Who cares about jackets if there's a fire? Eyes alive, knowing all along, this wasn't the real thing. We were ill prepared to survive, standing outside by the flag, shivering with it, waiting for the all clear that seemed to take a lifetime. 
No idea how short a lifetime could be when you always follow directions. You'll stand here quiet until they say it's clear. If you're talking, they won't let you back. Amazing, those things that silence us. And it sure sticks with you for a long time, right? It sure does. <laughs> Um, and this last one, I think you've heard before too. Um, this is, I uh, can't see the photo, but it's based on a photo of, yep, you totally can't see it, uh, based on a photo of someone in the National Gallery. And it's called Artist. I'm reminding you to go back, rewind, even if only in the folds of your mind. Go back to the gallery, wear your dark glasses and Calvary coat. Be that thumbprint against the white wall, austere in the art of your own dress, halls hailing you just for being yourself, as if you were light itself. Return to the paintings that reflected you, retelling your story by heart. Step lightly into the stairwell. Hear how the right kind of marble echoes your lightest steps speaks of the days when your brightest thoughts were on brush strokes and hue and any kind of reframing had to do with you. Hear how the halls repeat your name. Listen as they whisper it again, reminding everyone what it is to be. You were always meant to be beauty. We all were. Lovely. I just thought I'd comment on what you said about ekphrastic writing. And I, I remember when I first um, discovered the concept um, as a teacher, you know, like mid-career, I mean, all of a sudden this new concept came to, you know, I mean, I, I, I stumbled on it somehow. Um, and at that time, nobody really talked about it. Nobody knew it. I found myself constantly introducing it to people and I introduced it to my daughter because I taught her in creative writing. Um, but, you know, not that many years later, everybody knows it. I mean, it's all over and really popular. So it's just really funny how, you know, how concepts like that, you know, can be, I, I guess, almost buried, I guess, because it's not like it didn't happen in ancient Greece, right? Um, so it's really interesting how that happens. And I feel like that's true of a lot of different kinds of poetic po poetic forms also. Um, like the way, you know, you write a lot of haiku in addition to other short poems, but, you know, that's something that has seemed to go in and out of vogue over, you know, many years. Um, and it, and can also be very place-based, right? Because a lot of times people are using images that they're actually observing when they're writing haiku, especially the traditional nature type. Anyway, I look forward to seeing your next book. Uh -huh. And I thank you very much. And um, Rich, I, are you still here, Rich? I know he said he was gonna slip out or, a little early, so he may have had to go. Um, it's his anniversary and they're going out to dinner. Um, so at this time, Linda, I have you on for open mic and I have a couple of other possibilities of people and I might share one if there's time. So. John, are you after Linda? Brian, did you decide to join in? Yes, okay. Leslie, do you have one you wanna read? Okay, and um, Joy, would you like to read a poem? I'm gonna pass tonight, thanks. Okay, it's nice to hear your voice. Um, and Mark, would you like to read a, a place poem? Yes, I would. Uh, it's a real important uh, genre, you might say to me, if you don't mind. I didn't know there was going to be open mic. I'm kind of new. Around it, you know. I'd love to. Thank you. Happy to include you. OK, so I, I think we ought to be able to do it. Don't don't pick your longest poems, but um, we have until eight o'clock and I don't mind going a couple minutes over. But because Cheryl, Cheryl Cooley is running this Zoom in absentia, um, I don't want to take advantage either. Okay, so Linda, why don't you start us out? Okay, uh, thank you, Kathy. And it's been a pleasure listening to the two poets who are featured tonight, really lovely. Um, I actually have two poems that I could 
put together, but in the interest of your time, I probably won't read the first one. Okay. Um, the first one, um, just to give you the context, um, is about when I moved to the Shenandoah Valley from Arlington, Virginia, and it was a great pleasure and I, the beauty of it was wonderful. So that was the context in which I wrote the next one, um, which was to do with the fact that in its um, wisdom, the county I live in decided to make the area I lived in um, uh, what they called a medium density residential and light commercial area. <laughs> so this is the second poem. I call it Rock on Clay. I wake distressed too early. Massive trucks rev up the dawn. Percussive raps against the window panes vibrate through muscles. Sorry, I'm getting up. Every daylight hour, cranes, trailers, excavators trundle the construction site. Beep, staccato, reverse, dig dirt, beep, reverse, heave dirt. All morning, red dust stings my eyes like clouds from craters craggier than the moon. Machines continue clanging, banging, droning, whining. My nerves twitch, my brain sparks, symbols bruise my ears. Sorry, the, the paper keeps on twitching <laughs> in sympathy with the poem, I think. Okay, symbols bruise my ears, sear my mind, drums thump, roll thump. Mid-afternoon, drenching rain, truck wheels cling, sucking mud, lightning flashes, thunder cracks, men dash for trucks, their moisture wicking overalls, sopping wet. evening and on a concrete field of compacted clay pooled water glimmers under blue gold skies rocks lie strewn across the steaming site like debris from outer space beautiful so many images with so many senses that really make that come alive Yes, <laughs> you can feel the intensity of it. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. John, oh, yeah. I should tell you all, I just moved away from that. Place oh, yeah. To a much calmer place near the Eastern Mennonite University with wonderful old trees and old churches, and it's just lovely. I can tell you're happier. <laughs> All right, John. Sorry, it took me a minute. Okay. Um, so like Linda, I, I also live in the Shenandoah Valley. And um, um, so I, I'm, I'm about to move out uh, as evidenced by these empty shelves. <laughs> I'm about in the process of moving out of the Shenandoah Valley. Um, and specifically, um, this house that we've lived in for 27 years um, in just outside of the town of Winchester, Virginia. Um, so the summer, uh, besides packing and, and everything else we've been doing, um, I've been working on a series of poems um, that are under the, the title of Thoughts of a Man who is sold, Whose House Has Sold and Is About to Be Torn Down. Um, it's a little bit of a long story about why the house is to be torn down, but it has a great deal to do with exactly what Linda was talking about. Um, and um, so I have one piece here I'd like to share. Um, of course, you know, in, in this space and, and 
you know, and, and it's about to be moving away from here. I've been, we've been really just saying our goodbyes. Um, and um, and th this particular piece in the series is called To the Mulberry I Used to Know by Name. Your name escapes me, erased by the chalk-eating fairies of age, the name-stealing gnomes of weed. The blank space where your name once lived beside runes and the names of dogs we buried, a missing tooth and the smile that kept us here. Still, it isn't like we said that much, what with the natter of starlings frantically eating and shitting your fruit and rank purple splatters. Then the quiet beads of the quiet beads sweating on the still lip of summer, understated yellow fall, and of course winter's slow motion nod on neighborly gales. Could be I made it up all along. More a little cloud of sounds burped over the green fields of my imagination than a name overheard on the party line to Tirna Nog. And maybe what I fear isn't the lapse, but the spell of living here being broken, ravaged for weeks by talons and beaks, and just like your torn and ragged leaves disappearing. No, oh, beautiful. Where are you moving, John? We are moving to the town of Cape and Bridge uh, in Hampshire County, West Virginia. Oh. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if I should be telling you that because I'd like to keep my my position in the Poetry Society of Virginia, but I'm 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 planning on doing so even from mm -hmm. being literally right on the border. I, I've been a lifelong Virginian, so I, I think I have the right to, to hold on to this position, even if I'm physically in the in the state of West Virginia. The all just gonna have to take that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you. Um Thank you. Brian, you're on. Okay. Uh, first, I want to say the two features were fantastic. And uh, there was no way I was going to miss that performance, and it was well worth it. Um, I chose a spiritual place, and I'll just jump right into the piece. Uh, it's called uh, Sacred Boundaries. Blessed are we, the transcribers of emotion, unknown to you in flesh, intimate with you in spirit. This holy gift given does not mean we escape the pain of knowing of the traumas of life felt before birth, it seems. To see the beautiful and the murky as it is and still choose to be born into this predetermined facade in this construct of time making a simple reality out of temporary theater. We intensely attempt to master perfection of our craft, a sweet sorcery used to curse and bless, to sustain you with words spoken in tongues, to live within this craft of insanity. But if weeds are left to grow and fester, our mind will slowly burn our memories. We will reach our sacred boundaries we will verge upon suicide. We, the woeful poets, the uninvited guests who bring the passion of fires and leave ashes unswept, measuring our time only in profound accomplishments or tarnished turmoil. We are the ones who were born but not prepared to give until bare and bleeding to live with our essence deprived, we hunger and dwell in spiritual arenas in an unsolicited manner. But our mission was only to help you to see that all of us were created within the same origin. Our time spent screaming and not being heard. Yes, our time never truly being understood. Blessed are we 
the transcribers of emotion, unknown to you in flesh, intimate with you in spirit. We are the faint glimmers in rivers, wavering in the golden light, and then soon forgotten. Thank you. And wow. I, I wrote that piece uh, after learning of a uh, uh, poet committing suicide. Wow. So I had to create that piece to escape the energy of that. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Appreciate your sharing that with us. Leslie, how about you? Okay. Um, this is a poem that was written kind of as an ekphrastic to Stanley Kunitz's Boy in a White Flannel Nightgown. Um, and it was kind of inspired by that, but it harkens back to a place in my childhood um, when we first came to the US. Um, and we lived in this small town in Western New York State. Um, blessed place to have a childhood. No such thing as a locked door. So this I dedicate to my brother. Boy in the white flannel nightgown. He was the son of immigrants who would never understand the cruelty of bedtime in the soft summer darkness when stadium suns still illuminated diamonds in the dirt, the smell of sweat and tobacco and the smack of leather on leather and wood. So on those nights, he built tents out of the sheets and dugouts of pillows to cradle the small plastic, plastic transistor as he listened to the passage of innings. He knew each player's stats and often whispered them before the play-by-play. -play. He tracked the home team all season, especially that miraculous game that would clinch the pennant. Coming down to a tied game, bottom of the ninth, two out, runners on first and third, and a count of two and one on the heroic left fielder. Then the pitch, curving low inside, the smack of leather and string on wood, and the little radio crackled, going, going, gone, as my brother raced to the backyard in his nightshirt to see the meteor of that home run blaze into the heavens. Sorry, Kathy. Oh, sorry, I was just saying thank you. That was wonderful. And it does seem like an idyllic, you know, memory in place. I forgot that I muted because I heard a little noise in the background. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Mark? Okay, I'm back, thank you. Uh, thank you for letting me go at this time. Uh, and first of all, I wanna thank Kathy for including me again. Uh, I'm very new at this stage of my writing and what a pleasure to hear all of you and aspire to where you are in, in your writing. It, it, I, I wanna keep going. Uh, on th Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, my wife, Laura, and I were up in or down from here in Galax at the old Fiddler's Convention, just loving it. We'd never been before. We love that music. We love that place. And we took a side trip up to Speedwell. The locals call it more like Speedwell. And we went up there because Laura's daddy grew up there. And beautiful place, wonderful memories except we found something very important to her father and the community was gone. I call this the Speedwell Church Disaster. Way up in the Virginia mountains where the ridges roll like waves on the Atlantic, up where Laura Ann James' daddy, Bob James, was raised on Cripple Creek. Yeah, the Cripple Creek in the song. He played it on banjo. Up where the names on the headstones are still alive, the few families of those hollers, Shanahan, Nolan, Whalen, strong Irish Catholics who came to Speedwell generations ago to mine the ore and wring some corn or hay out of stiff, dry clay. Butch told us all the good stories from the porch at the Speedwell store. Did you all know the Catholic diocese tore down the little church building? Bob James got baptized before its altar 
and his grandparents, his mom and daddy and six sisters of their nine children are buried out front. Laura knows daddy's sister Regina paid for the empty church upkeep till she was laid there. Diocese big shots didn't have the decency to bur bury the church remains, a damn pile of half white painted lumber rubble, a brand spanking new copperhead nest. Thank goodness Laura's daddy can't see what happened. I reckon first they consecrate, then they desecrate. So much for the old structure stories. See that cornerstone, St. Patrick's 1906? Here Bob James was born. Now it's just another tombstone for where for years and years people prayed to the Virgin, married their sweethearts, and honored their dead. Now who honors this sacred ground? Well, Mr. Funk ain't Catholic, but he still mows the cemetery lawn just out of respect. Did you all know his second cousin is front desk at Speedwell School? Dear Lord, if they knock the school down too, there's not much history left. Take a good look out there. Sunken places in the woods behind the ruins. That's where they buried the black folk. No markers, no names for those who worked and raised their children and died harder than anyone else in these parts. They had stories. Laura and me picked up pieces of colored glass from what were church windows and a stone from the foundation, our memorial. We'll put that up with Daddy's banjo in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Who will tell the stories when old Butch is gone? You may say that you're new to poetry, but I can't really tell. And you're definitely not new to performance. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. You're very kind. Uh, I, uh, I'm learning a lot from you all, too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Alan, I didn't see you initially when I was flipping you know, through the screen. So would you like to share something? Thank you. Not right now. Thank you. OK, thank you. All right, then um, I'll, I'll read one poem and um, I'm going to I'm going to share a poem that um, is about a, a place in Richmond and um, this might be a little bit more unusual, but it's a place where um, I haven't actually been in this exact spot, but you'll understand um, why I'm musing about it. It's called The River. At the Yellow House on West 29th, I'll back up and say, I have been to the yes, Yellow House, but I haven't been um, to the spring. So that way you'll understand. The River. At the Yellow House on West 29th, in the year she read Tomas Transtromer, Sweden's 2011 Nobel Laureate, the college girl discovered the spring on her running trail along the James, buttermilk trail near Riverside Drive, where she carried glass jugs in her backpack to collect cool water from the buttermilk spring, a historic site near Canoe Run Park and Canal Lock Ruins, where workers once stored cans of dairy, milk, butter, buttermilk to deliver throughout Richmond. Images as fresh as spring water populated Transtromer's poems, images as fresh as fish pulled from the James, as fresh as the blue heron standing statuesque, sometimes in a twisted yoga pose on shore until the moment of flight, soaring low over mirrored water, darting up to tree canopy. River creatures comforted the college girl, reminding her of home beside a reservoir the dammed up Occoquan River. Transtromer's poems consoled her at a time when a concussion challenged intellect but sparked creativity, a painting frenzy until the walls of the yellow house were covered in art. I never joined her on this river run, but today I trace her steps, imagine the rush of spring water, the sound of life crashing out from a natural tap, taste the refreshing snap of her spirit, as I swallow. Once, Transtromer found his way into the college girl's poem, but she revised him away. Each time I read the new version, I missed him there. Perhaps it was the reversal, a daughter introducing her mother teacher to a new poet. I wanted to honor him, to remember him inside a poem, to recall what she'd given me, the half-finished heaven. So I wrote my own poem, 
beginning at the same yellow house where she lived only one year. Now, more than four years have passed since she joined Transtromer, where even the ghosts take a drink, where water glitters between the trees, and I see them together through the window of the river. And those last lines, even the ghosts take a drink and water glitter, glitters between the trees are from the poem, The Half-Finished Heaven by Tomas Trinstromer. Thank you. So places um, have taken on a lot of different meaning, like in terms of physical places, like places we celebrate, places that we're annoyed with, places that we're imagining, places that are part of a spiritual consciousness. And it was lovely to hear so many different varieties today, um, both from our featured poets, thank you, Catherine and Rich, uh, and also from all of you who participated in the open mic. So we have another Poetry of Place coming later in September, um, and I'll have another flyer up and spread the, the news um, in the next uh, September 1st Northern Region newsletter. And um, also in, in September, I'll, I'll just remind people that Claudia Gary is going to be doing one of her workshops um, on sonnet writing, which I'm very excited about because she usually teaches them for the Writers' Center where you have to um, you know, pay a significant amount to attend. Uh, of course, this is just a, a one you know, short workshop, like an hour and a half workshop, but I feel like we can get a taste of some of what she does. And um, then if we wanna pursue something um, you know, more detailed, we can also participate at the Writers' Center if we want to. So um, I am also working on a scheduling of in the, of the um, Where Art Meets the Line. It's been a while since we've had one, um, but I just wanted to let you know that I haven't forgotten that series. I've just been really busy. <laughs> so thank you all Kathy? for participating today. Kathy, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, Catherine, um, how could we find your new book coming out? Oh, um, very good question. Um, usually if you go on my website, I will have it announced on my website. I'm also on Facebook. I'm on uh, Twitter. Well, the platform formerly known as Twitter, um, <laughs> Instagram. But let me drop my website into the chat. Who's publishing this one? Um, that is being published under an imprint. Mm -hmm. ATW Publishing, um, katherinegothart.com, is it? Yeah. Yeah, uh, and I considered actually going back and asking uh, San Francisco Bay Press if they would be interested in doing um, a hard copy version of it too. So um, so we'll see. So Jersey Okay, so this, is a, this one is an ebook initially. Then. It's going to be an ebook, yeah, in print. I'm just not sure where I want to do the print because because it is micro poetry and the market for that is very different. <laughs> right, right. I bet. Well, looking for it. yeah, definitely. Thank you. thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much again. And um, I will stop the recording um, and um, hope for the best. <laughs>